Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here at my next Airspeed's Cora rewatch video. This one's going to be for K212 Harmonic Convergence. And uh, yeah, this is definitely a part of the finale here. We really set up the last episodes to be the final battle in this one. Um, and we get some, I think, surprisingly good moments. I think this is where Eska and Desna really sort of start to shine a little bit more and get like their character arc properly played out here with um, the doubts that begin to come into play with regards to them finding out the, I suppose, true final stage of Unalak's plan. Unalak saying that plan uh, obviously is a really interesting factor just ahead of Harmonic Convergence and the whole dark avatar thing, which makes complete sense. That was the entire dynamic that you were meant to take out of beginnings that um, Juan turned the tides in the favor of Rava and the way to turn it back in Vatu's favor is to have a kind of human person on his side and obviously the idea of a dark avatar I don't know if it was on everyone's mind like is this possible but it makes sense given that this seems like this really long forged plan that uh, Unalak uh, and Vatu have seemingly like been planning this for a very long time it would make sense that this was the go-to thing that even like Vatu who I'm sure at a base level isn't overly happy with the idea of like oh I have to merge with a human to to win but the fact is that he obviously knew that this is the way to make it happen and if that requires using a human then so be it so um you know a lot of interesting stuff going on in this one i think for sure 13 and 14 are the more impactful episodes of the finale and this one ends up being mostly set up but there's still some great moments here uh, like like the whole boomy section is really good but um yeah this is this is setting up the stakes the the time crunch the the desperation of this that they really get across the stakes of if, if this happens, if Vatu is freed, like, Korra has some confidence that she can handle him, but she knows that Unalak's out there as well, so she has to bring in, like, uh, her team with her, and then there's the other plot of, we have to find Janora while all this is happening, because that's another time crunch of, her body can't stay alive forever, and we've already just established here, she's been like this for a week. Her body's been basically been kept alive by Kaya's healing and now Katara's healing. Um, and this is becoming a real, real struggle. So um, a lot of stuff going on here. We don't get a lot on the you know, you know, Tenzin side of things right now. But uh, this is, I suppose, Boomi's chance to more step into the spotlight with referencing like some of the crazy plans he's come up with. Uh, the eventual plan they go with of like the drop in from above attack from the air plan comes from one of Boomi's ideas and then is sort of like executed, put together by Asami. And um, <clears throat> it it ends up being like one of Boomi's best like moments in like the entire series as we see um, what he does to basically free everyone once the initial attack sort of fails. Because it, it's a really cool action scene getting to see obviously the biplane stuff with Mako and Bolin attacking from the biplane, Asami flying it. The northern troops are completely prepared for some sort of an attack like this, so it really going against them. And then when Ugi comes in, they're getting attacked by spirits and getting weighed down like that. And then, of course, Eska and Desna are, like they have been for a lot of this book, they've been the ones to sort of turn the tides properly towards Unalak's side. And everyone crashes, everyone's taken out, everyone's captured, except Boomi. And it sets up a... Hilarious, but also really, I think, a, a good sequence for him. That he's, they've obviously been establishing the whole idea of, like, he's the non-bender, you know, he gets the least amount of respect as being one of Aang's kids. But here is, like, him obviously sort of bumbling his way through this to make this happen. Basically creating one of the old stories he's been telling the entire episode. But by the end of it, he's just like, I could tell this story, but... You know, it worked. Let, let's just get on with it. And it, it. That was fun to see, like, you know, you have three or four scenes where he kind of annoys everyone by telling the full story. And then he actually makes one of them happen directly. Where they're asking him how he did it. And he's just like, 
let's let's just let's just move past it. It, it, it was it was well done. Um, I like the idea of like the this at least this one spirit, you know, liking the music and him thinking that like, oh, I'll just get all the dark spirits around the portal and like make them follow me and. It kind of worked, but what he ends up basically doing is just causing chaos in the camp. And because he's just, like, reacting to what's going on here, grabbing anything he has, he ends up just, like, getting everything to chase him, causing enough damage himself, and, like, getting all of these, like, accidents and mistakes happening, that he just causes the entire camp to basically be destroyed. He takes out nearly every soldier, and the big thing is that slides through Eska and Desna and Naga then comes in to knock the two of them out and that's how everyone is freed. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool save of like giving you that kind of final comedy moment really. Like they, they play on the comedy a little bit more when you know you I suppose also have a little bit of the true emotion between Eska and Bolin but for the most part like everything after this is very very serious because like we have to bring the stakes up as high as possible because this is the most high stakes finale of all of them because this is this isn't just like oh a tyrant will take over the world this is you know the the future of humanity is at risk here we the danger here is that Vatu if he takes over if spirits take over this will be the end of humanity and the line turtles aren't here to protect everyone this time and so if Korra and her friends can't stop this, they're in an awful position, even worse than we were at the beginning of um, Beginnings. So um, I love the stakes that they establish here of just that there's not enough time. And especially once they're, everyone's freed and they kind of, they, they make the plans of like, Asami, okay, you bring my father back to be healed with my mom. And they're just like, uh, she just gives that speech before they head into the portal of, this is it, that this is the most serious thing we've ever done, you know, and if we don't do it, and she just leaves it unsaid, the idea of, if we don't make this work, we're dead, there's no point even saying it, and the fact that she brings in Malcolm and Bolin with her is because she knows that she has to close the portal, so she will be defenseless basically while she's doing that, so she needs to, them to hold off Unalak while all of this is happening so they can stop Vatu from being freed. And it's a lot of pressure to put a Maku and Bowl in because we know how powerful Unalak is. And I think they put up a very, very good fight in this and that they, they do hold him off. It's just that Korra obviously is fighting against the fact that Harmonic Convergence is so close that the portal is even harder to close now as it is. And... I like the implication that, in a way, Mako and Bolin were there to sort of almost like sacrifice themselves if they had to, just, just to slow Unalak down to make this happen. That's the level of stakes that we're at now, where this is sacrifice yourself to save the world territory. So, um, very, very intense stuff going on here, which um, I, I, I think really works in this finale. Um, just seeing how much resistance they were met with in the air when the biplane is coming in, when Oogie's coming in, the fact that they get like injured and they, they clearly show signs of like the injuries. It's not like they're like terribly injured, but like Tonrock, they they continue the continuity of like he's he's out of action because Unalak beat him. Uh, but like Korra having her hair down for like the rest of the 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 rest of the episodes and um, and them all showing some signs of like wear and tear that you know, these crazy things that they're going through are taking stuff out of them. That they have to put it all on the line against Unalak in this situation. Um, but I think we need to talk about the Eska, Desna and Unalak scenes here because for me, it's probably one of the biggest, like I suppose, character takeaways from this entire um, episode. Just, um, the we've we've seen it a little bit before, like Desna especially beginning to have some doubts, Eska gaining some of those doubts when she saw Unalak's reaction to like an injured Desna and the fact that he didn't help, um, and just especially here once they come in and are like, okay, we've done everything, can we go home now? And Unalak's like, no, like uh, there's still more to come and. He has to finally reveal to them to them that like 
no, there's there's more to my plan. And that we're basically going to create a new world order here. The world will be forever changed because of what's about to happen. And they're really beginning to look at each other like, what have we gotten ourselves in for? Like, we agreed with the idea of the portals being open, you know, you know, reconnecting the world with spirituality, spirits coming back into the world. But like, what's he talking about here? How badly are things going to change? And especially when he comes in to basically gloat in front of Korra and say that, you know, he's going to merge with uh, Vatu and form a dark avatar and he'll be the new kind of, um, sort of, uh, he, do he doesn't say bridge, but like, he'll be the new one in that position and he'll do it right because he's all about the spirits and stuff like that. But I love how in this scene, the, the contrast of kind of point of views here of him pointing out that you aren't spiritual, you, he's pointing out to Korra, you aren't spiritual, you couldn't see it if it was right in front of you, um, and because of that, you know, you barely are the bridge, there doesn't need to be a bridge. I fundamentally disagree with what Avatar 1 did in, you know, separating humans and spirits, so I'm going to fix that by doing all of this and, you know, letting the spirits come up, take over the world, but it's, it's him going so far in the opposite direction. Whereas you, you'd say Korra right now probably lies in terms of like her balance between being the avatar for humans and for spirits. It's definitely more leaning towards humans, but she's trying with the spirit. She's aware. She's beginning to become uh, aware of the need to address what's going on with the spirits. Um, but Unalak is just all the way over here on the spirit side of things. And he's forgotten about the humanity side of things. And you can see that by the fact that how he treats Eska and Desna. How he, he can't seem to comprehend why they'd be doubting what's going on here. That why they'd be upset potentially at the idea of him saying, I'm going to become a dark avatar with the spirit of darkness. Uh, in that I think everyone except Unalok seems to just be aware of the fact of like, Okay, we, we, we don't know the full story, only Korra really fully knows the, full, the story, and I think she tells it to like Janora and, you know, Tenzin and so on, that the reason, like, the Avatar as it is now, Rava and Wan, Rava and Korra, is like a, is not this kind of monstrous kind of combination, is because it's a fundamentally a union that came from a friendship, and because of that, neither took over fully the other one. Um, and so it's more of a balanced kind of union. Here, what we're going to see is Vatu, who is not going to just allow himself to just forever be within uh, Unalak. We're going to see him try and take over. He's all about chaos and, you know, having control over things. It's not going to go the way that Unalak thinks it is, and everyone's aware of that. Korra especially, when she points out that, I love the line of, like, when she says to Desna, you know, like, if this happens, like, he won't be your father anymore because it's not going to be like me, where I'm still me, but I can use, like, the Avatar state and extra spear powers. What happens when he merges with Vatu is not going to be something that you like. And I love how they reference that. When it happens, you see the first reaction you basically go to is Eska and Desna, and you see how shocked and appalled they are. We'll get to that in the next episode. Um, but it's uh, crazy to kind of really see that. I suppose, is it episode, start of episode 14 or end of 13? It, it, it's coming up anyway. But I, I, I love the subtle development here of, you know, they end up escaping without really convincing Eska and Desna, but it's always there in the back of their minds that this has happened. Um, uh, and the the doubts beginning to come into play because you see them both defend their father here of like he's like the greatest man in the world like we really respect him and especially Desna this is I suppose the one really unique Desna thing that they seem to emphasize here is that even more so than I think Eska the the respect that Desna gives to his father is meant to be this, I think, big character arc. And so the idea of him beginning to have doubts about that is meant to really signify the turning point for both of them. 
Whereas at least with Eska, you can tell that she, there's there's more going on with her with regards to the whole romance stuff with Bolin, and you know, I suppose getting a little bit more of her personality. Whereas Desna, it is more of just full on loyalty to Unalak. Um, but I like how defensive he gets when he points out that like my father is the greatest man in the world. But it comes after all of these doubts coming into play, and they're questioning things of like. Okay, we've been fine with more or less how everything's gone up to now, but there's been a few little issues. Now he's telling us that he wants to become a dark avatar and that he wants the world to be basically uh, taken over by chaos. And I think especially when they see what happens, like the, the world basically becomes taken over by this like purple aura and the sky goes dark and you see the the, the northern the spiritual lights i suppose in the physical world they really are beginning to be just like okay this is this is bad i don't think we want this to go the dark way as much as it like unalak has convinced us uh, that this is the right way to go about things um and i i think it's important to really emphasize the eska desna stuff here because you know they're not the most important characters in book two but they've always been like a key factor in that they are basically responsible for why Korra gets kind of like knocked out loses her memories and beginnings happens uh, in a way they're responsible for kind of turning the tide in the like Tonrock Unalak battle in that they sort of injure him a little bit before he goes into that battle so you know it, it's, it's a little bit imbalanced uh, they're the ones who takes the biplane out of the air, more or less, in earlier on here. And so, them, in a way, turning on Unalak is meant to be a big turning point. And as the most loyal people to him, they're, them beginning to doubt his plans is meant to show you the bad side of Unalak's plan. This is the... It, this is, in a way, the... Unalak is revealed to be a bender... And this is why the Equalist movement has its problems. It doesn't take away the fact that there's still issues between benders and non-benders, but he's gone about things and he's taken it too far. This is him saying that. And what's so interesting about it is that come the end of the book, Korra is basically going to agree with pretty much half of what Unalak says here and disagree with the other half. Uh, spreading spirituality throughout the world by forcing it upon the world with uh, Vatu, who hates humans, uh, combined with a Unalak who has lost his humanity, despite the pleas from Tonrock, which I, I love that they use Tonrock in that way, that they've always, over the course of this book, said Tonrock isn't spiritual, but he's a family man. He cares about Korra a lot. He cares about his wife, and that's that's what he has there. He has his humanity. He is one of the more human characters, even if his weakness, you would say, is that he's very dismissive of spirituality. But even he is making the appeal to Unalak's humanity of like, are you willing to give up what you are to become this? Because even he has come to accept that, like, okay, if Korra has a spirit of light within her, and I can still like really clearly see that she's my daughter she just has this extra responsibility the spirit of darkness is not going to allow whoever you know they merge with to just remain who they are and um, and the idea that I, th I think he even points out that like think of like eska and desna in this and he doesn't then that's the real kind of signifier of he has put his uh, humanity completely aside to focus on the spirits above all else and combined with the fact that we later on like learn that this is him taking the Red Lotus plan too far. The idea was always to release Vatu and let him do what he wanted to, but this is him making that over grab for power by m wanting to merge with Vatu. Um, and he feels that like, okay, this is my way to get in on basically the control of the world Vatu's obviously going to control the world, but if I merge with him, we will control the world. And it's him, like, assuming his loyalty will sort of be repaid, when, as we later learn to find out, Vatu only cares about using, uh, like, Unalak as basically a power-up. Um, the fact that if he merges with, uh, with him, he gets bending, he gets water bending. 
and in a way that's the only core takeaway here. He gets avatar level powers if he merges with Unalak, whereas Unalak wanted it all, wanted the like the two of them in charge kind of dream of Unalak and Vatu controlling this new world with its new spirituality, but you see where he begins to lose sight of everything and the idea of like he's like what's he in control of we get he gets on with spirits but would he really be fine with just the world the, the humans going extinct basically apart from himself uh, so uh, lots of very interesting things to think about here for sure and um yeah basically you know ending the the episode with Vatu being freed it's it's a really cool scene the, you see the planets align like they did in beginnings and then they kind of show you it a bit clearer than they did there whereas there it was kind of more of like okay we walk in the, more, the focus is very clearly on the battle here it's about showing you everything happening you see the portals join up the two colors kind of change into just kind of golden energy and that giving Vatu inside the tree of time the power to break free of his prison and Korra is now facing like this crazy enemy, the spirit of darkness. It's this battle she's been in a way destined to fight, but is she prepared for it? Um, is obviously the big question. And it's it's a really really like interesting one because like Juan once he merged with Vot, uh, once he merged with Rava was able to defeat Vatu without too much problems, but here. The issue is that Unalak is there. So it's this fight to kind of keep Unalak and Vatu from merging here on out. You have Mako and Bolin there as well to help. But, and in a way, what it really comes down to in this fight is... Um, is Korra kind of good enough to face Vatu one-on-one? -on -one, or will her lack of spirituality and understanding of what's going on here allow Vatu to take the, the, the victory whereas Juan had the advantage in a similar situation and then almost more importantly will the brothers when it really gets down to it be able to take on Unalak um, and I think this is a great example of just how powerful Unalak is him being able to hold off the brothers and, and take the advantage over them um, anything else in this episode um, again, I, I think it's another example of like a Sami sort of being sidelined in that like, okay, it makes sense. She has to bring um, Tonrock back back to Senna and Katara to be healed. Um, but it, it more or less is a way to just take her out of the fight completely because she's not going to be of any use basically in the fight that we're about to ha that's about to happen here. Um, to, to, to have a Sami be able to be a threat to Unalak, I think that's probably taking things too far and in spiritual matters I don't think she's going to be able to be of much help so you sort of had to take her out of things but it sort of is a way of confirming that like yeah like this entire book like Korra and Asami haven't really had any sort of a notable scene together and um, which is it's interesting to think about given what the relationship is by the end of the, sh the show um yeah B Boomy has a very good episode definitely one of his best here in terms of like what he does here gives you know the world hope basically he allows them that last opportunity to actually have a chance at kind of stopping this and it's it's, it's a really nicely done scene and a little bit with Senna I, I like that we get to see Senna again I always really like her interactions with Korra again not too much going on here uh, just kind of her pointing out that like there's a lot of injured people after the battle um, and it, this is also one where, like, is do we get the reveal in this episode that Senna is a healer, that she has the ability to heal? Because obviously, as Korra basically asks Asami, bring my father back to my mother, because he's injured, which is sort of implying that Senna can heal. And then just the fact that Senna is out there as the kind of, like, first responder in a way to anyone wanting medical treatment is almost like... Is she involved in the healing process at some stage? Katara, of course, is the main healer because she's the best in the world. But is Senna actually someone who can heal? I want to say yes, probably. Um, because we know she's a waterbender. That is confirmed. Uh, but they've never really addressed, like, 
they've never shown her being able to water bend, but it'd be a cool thing if that's an ability that she has in that like, of course, Korra says that she learns from Katara the healing, but I'd also like to, to think that, you know, she learned some stuff from her parents as well. She learned the, the high energy, you know, great water bending from her father, but she learned the healing from her mother and then learned super advanced healing from Katara. That would be a really cool thing if that ever was uh, revealed at some point and then like was Senna trained in healing by Katara? That would be a nice thing as well to get. Just to, just to learn a little bit more about Senna because she is from the south. Um, but yeah, I think that's most of what I want to talk about in the episode. Um, oh, we get a little bit of the uh, romance drama stuff. Uh, that's the final thing to talk about. Um, just the kind of turnaround scene on the whole, you know, just uh, rip the leech off thing of Bolin kind of returning the favor to Mako in that he's a bit too afraid to really go up to Korra and reveal the full truth and in a way it's like a little bit of a weird one where like look it's a crazy situation I get sort of what they're trying to go for here is that it speaks to the communication problems of the two of them but it's kind of like now this is an awkward situation in that like if she doesn't know the backstory suddenly you have to fill her in on what happened plus say that yeah and I broke up with you and almost have those emotions come back as they're heading into the biggest event in the world I can understand in this situation Mako choosing to be like okay no 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 we don't need to bring up this kind of romance drama just before we go into the battle for the fate of the world it's it, it's a very similar situation to like Katara and Aang in Ember Island Players the reason, the, the core reason why, like, Katara doesn't, like, commit to the relationship at that point in time is that they're days away from the big, big, big battle. And they don't need to bring in them as a new couple, adding a new factor into what's going on here. That Anne can deal with the potential confusion over, are they going to be together or are they not going to be together better than, you know... I have to defend my new girlfriend. And, and, and similarly here, but with the awkwardness of like, that's a very painful memory to suddenly like bring back to her at this point in time. Should I say it now? Admittedly, you know, I think the dynamic they're more going for here is that, oh, Mako and his, uh, you know, struggle with romances, struggling communicating. But I, I feel that it's one of those situations where I don't think anything right now speaks to their relationship dynamic until Korra actually gets her memories back. Until she has full context for what happened in the past, the two of them I don't think can have a proper discussion about their relationship. We'll get to the discussion that they have in two episodes time, but um, right now I think yes, obviously the emphasis here is still on drama, but I don't think it's one of the worst examples of drama that we've had so far. Um, but yeah, that's been the review for Harmonic Convergence. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on the episode. But uh, yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.